Okay, we're back with our welding topic. We're going to talk about um, welds again, but now they're going to be in torsion and bending. So what I mean is last time we had this, this guy and we put a force maybe in this direction, pulling. I guess it could be pushing also, but we, we did it pulling. And the failure was something like this. So weld broke in these three locations. Um, we didn't have a weld on the, the back side over here. Um, and so we, we did that, just direct shear. Now we're going to do two different things today. One of them, we're going to put a force over here. And this one we're going to call torsion. And the weld will break this way. Um, it'll still be a shear failure, but uh, instead of doing this number, we're going to do this kind of thing. This one acts a lot like the bolt pattern uh, with a, um, I think we called it a centric load um, when we did that one. And this will be very similar to this process with a bolt pattern. Um, and then the last one we do will be something like this. Maybe you, you let's see if we can make sure we get this kind of, yeah, there we go. Um, weld something like this and then it comes off this way. So this one we'll call uh, bending. So it would be like a little cantilever piece. The piece here, this piece is a cantilever piece. Um, and there would be a point load maybe out here on the end. And it would pop off of there. Um, so we're going to do both of those. Um, these are actually pretty straightforward. Uh, the, the torsion one, the one we'll do first, <coughs> is possibly a little more involved um, because there is... Uh, some different things to calculate that uh, we haven't done before the bending one your book doesn't even have a whole page on the bending one uh, And uh, it's it's relatively straightforward uh, So this one is the one we're going to do right now in fact, let's use this setup and Calculate some stuff with it. So let's say that we have a well, Last time I remember I drew the line through there and we had to try and white it out. So let's do it this way this time. So here's our piece here and then we're going to weld it to this piece in the back over here and let's <coughs> review our weld symbols. Um, let's say that on this surface, well not surface but on this corner between these two so right here right up there we've got a weld these are going to be fillet welds this symbol when i draw the two triangles means that i've got a fillet weld so the triangle means fillet weld and i've got a fillet weld on the arrow side so the side the arrow is pointing to right here so that's this weld and then since I drew a triangle on the top of this line, that means I've got a fillet weld. Again, the triangle means fillet. I've got the fillet weld on the other side. So the other side means the side opposite of wherever the arrow is pointing. So the arrow is pointing to this side, so it means this side. So this one symbol creates a weld here and here. Um, and I think last time we used a 3 16th weld, so let's use that again. And then we don't really need any other information on our weld symbol. Uh, we, this would only create these two welds, though. Uh, we do want to have a weld back here. So let's... This isn't particularly good, the way I drew this. Whenever you have your brake right at a line, it gets confusing. It's better to have the brake, uh, this little knee in the symbol, not end up on a line. That's more like a, a drafting thing though not necessarily anything to do with the weld now we want it on the bottom because we want the arrow side the side we're pointing to and we'll keep the same size three these are three sixteenths if, it, if it's hard to see what that is um, and these are in inches these numbers can be inches or millimeters um, typically if it's a fraction it's going to be fractions of inches uh, and then if it's just a number, it's probably millimeters, but uh, your entire diagram would have to give you the information. A lot of times these kind of diagrams don't have um, 
they don't have units on all of the individual numbers. They'll have a note somewhere that all units are in and then they'll explain. Um, and on the diagram itself, we'll just have the numbers. Let's put some dimensions that we're gonna need. Uh, well, let's put our force. Force is gonna be over here. It'd probably been better to put all of this information down here so that it doesn't interfere with dimensioning our force, but I didn't think ahead, I guess. <clears throat> all right, we'll just dimension from down here. This we're gonna have as three, all of our units will be in inches or fractions of inches. Um, this will have as one and a half. And then here will be two. And I think that's all the dimensions that we need to start with anyway. We have our weld size, we have the dimensions of kind of where this uh, tab is placed on the background support and um, we need a value for our force. Let's say that it has a thousand pounds that it has to support. And we, we want to figure out if these welds, these three sixteenths inch welds on these three sides are suitable for doing that or not. So there's a couple of things we have to check. Um, we, we're mainly going to check the weld themselves, but you do also have to check the parent material. So remember a few things about the welding of the parent material. Um, your book has table 9-4, I believe it is. Let me get turned to it here, and I will show it to you. Yes. Table 9.4 and 9.3 is useful also. Uh, so 9.3 is going to give us our ultimate strength for the electrode material. So the material that you're melting in the welding process. Um, the yield strength and some other percent elongation also. But really we're just using the tensile strength, which um, you really can get from the name of the electrode itself. Remember the first two numbers are basically its minimum tensile strength, ultimate tensile strength. Uh, well, the minimum value for that. Um, and the one that's different in this book anyway is that 60. They actually have a 62 in there. I just use 60, um, but uh, it does list it as 62. Then it's got table 9.4, which gives different types of welds and then the permissible stress in that weld. So ours are fillet welds in shear, and uh, we can have 30% of our ultimate strength. So ultimate strength from here. We take 30% of that. That is our allowable, uh, permissible st stress in the weld itself. And then there's a note down here on the shear stress on the base metal is 40% of the yield strength of the base metal. Um, and there's one detail about that, that in the vicinity of the weld, you have to assume that the material properties uh, are the hot rolled properties. So maybe the material is already hot rolled, but say the material of this piece or this piece was cold drawn to begin with, at least in the vicinity of the well, you have to make the assumption that that material has been, uh, had enough heat in the welding process applied to that location that you need to use the hot rolled properties for that location. Um, you also have this table. We used it a little bit, um, and it gives you the same thing, this liable shear stress. So basically, this is table 9.3's numbers combined with the 30% from 9.4, and they just calculate it for you. So this table is kind of a shortcut. All right. So what we need to do here is let's look at our weld group. And by the weld group, the, the welds that are all part of one group, um, they all have to be the same size for the thing we're about to do. So if I had 3 16 inch welds here and a half inch weld here, then what I'm about to do uh, wouldn't work. Um, we'd have to take, we'd have to go back a step and not use the table that we're about to use. Um, so the table that we're about to use does assume 
these welds are all the same size and all the same type. So they're all fillet welds um, or whatever they might be. But um, this is really the table that we're about to use is really set up for fillet welds all of the same size. All right, so our weld group is here is one weld. Here is a weld. And here is a weld. And uh, that's our group. So there's a table, 9-1, a couple of pages over. Now there's two ta of these tables. There's 9-1 and 9-2. They look very similar. So make sure when you're using these, table 9-2, make sure you read the title of it. This is Bending Properties for Fillet Welds. We're, we're doing torsion right now. So we want table 9-1, torsional properties of fillet welds. So again, this table is only going to work for um, fillet welds. It's not going to work for a different type of weld. And down here at the bottom, all welds are of unit width. So um, in this equation, it's set up to where the, the dimension of the welds doesn't matter. And we'll calculate that later. It's got H in here for the weld length. Uh, the leg size, um, not the length, the leg size. And um, it is assuming that all the welds in any given group are the same size. They all have the same H. <clears throat> Here's our group, number four. So that shape, maybe if we zoom in a little, you can get that. Got to move some stuff around, though. There we go. So there's our shape. Uh, now, sometimes these might be mirrored or whatever. Uh, you can still, like if we had, instead of a C shape here, we had a mirror of a C, we could still use this. We just, you know, make the appropriate mirror changes in our equation. Um, so, or maybe if we had two parallel lines, but they were horizontal, we could still use this. You just switch X and Y, you know, things like that. So you can use them for other orientations. Um, it's gonna give us location of the centroid for this group. Uh, now, all of this, how they came about this set of equations is given the derivation on the previous page. Basically, they just treat the weld groups like rectangles, like we did right here, um, and calculate their centroid. So, area is the area of the throat of the entire weld group. So, the entire weld group's throat area is going to be here. We'll need that. Um, the location for the centroid of the weld group, we'll need that. And then this term over here called JU, um, this is the polar moment of inertia, but the U part means that it is a unitized version. So it doesn't have any uh, dimension about the weld in it. It's just the shape. It's treating the welds like a line and not an actual triangular shape or anything. So we use this and then multiply this value times um, 0.707H, so the 0.707H is the uh, throat size of the weld, and that equation is probably on the previous page. Let me, yeah, it's at the bottom. I have to zoom out down here. J, the thing we actually want in our equation, is 0.707H times JU, so that's the equation that we'll use. All right, so let's do some of that stuff. Um, why don't we do that in MathCAD? Let's find MathCAD. There we go. All right. So one thing we need is we're going to need the area of the weld. Um, now this one is relatively easy to calculate, but they do give us an equation in table 9-1. So I'm just looking at table 9-1, case number 4. And we'll type in the equation, 0 0.707 times H, we'll have to define what H is, times 2 times B, so we'll have to define what B is, plus D. And that's it. Now, it won't do anything yet because we haven't defined all these variables, so let's move up here and define those things. H is the weld size, uh, one of the sides, so let me make sure we're doing the right thing here. So on our, on our weld, like maybe right here, the cross section of it is a triangle. 
for the fillet wedge. Now, sometimes they're scooped in a little bit or they bulge out a little bit. We're assuming they're these nice, perfect little triangles. And H is that dimension. And what we're actually calculating when we do 0 0.707 times H is that distance. So that is the throat of the weld. Okay, so let's go back here. So H for us, uh, we said that it was 3 sixteenths of an inch. Okay, um, B and D are both from the table 9-1. So table 9-1 over here, B is uh, the one that we have as 1.5 inches and D is the one that we have as two inches. So we need to plug those in. So B one and a half inches, D two inches. Now we should be able to calculate our area if I put an equal sign, um, but let's put it in inches squared. All right, really small, which makes sense. These are relatively small welds and they're not a lot of them. So that seems reasonable. Um, let's calculate our location for our centroid. So the centroid we need is the centroid of the weld group. So we expect it to be somewhere right here. They label it G in your book. We need this because we're going to do a similar thing to what we did with the bolts. It, we're going to take this eccentric load, a thousand pounds at some distance, and we're going to convert it over to a, a point load, a thousand pounds at this centroid and a moment at this centroid. Um, and so we need to know the distance from the thousand pounds to the centroid of the group to create the moment part. Uh, so that's what we need the centroid for. All right, so it says, well, obviously, uh, the height of the centroid is just half of here. So G is, w is one inch this direction. We know that just by inspection. Um, what we want to know now is this one. They call this X sub C in our book in the uh, table 9-1. So let's, let's calculate that. X, well, actually, they call it X bar. Not totally sure how to make a bar symbol in this version of MathCAD, so we're just going to do X sub C. Or let's do G since we called it um, G on our picture. All right, so the X coordinate of the centroid is B squared, which we have defined, so that's good, over um, 2 times B plus D. Uh, let's put that in inches. That seems reasonable, 0.45 inches. So it says that this distance, oh, you know, you'd have to be careful here because uh, the book is telling you where X is measured from. So X bar is measured from the left side over and not from the right side over. So make sure you get that correct. Um, otherwise, your numbers will be a little bit off. All right, so we've done that. Um, now we can calculate the moment. Let's go ahead and put our force in here, 1,000 pounds. So this is the force, the point load that we're applying to the end of the cantilever part of our tab. And our bending moment is equal to the force, whoops, I called it the capital F, times um, three inches, well, let's do a parenthesis, three inches plus X, Oh, well, no, plus um, 1.5 inches. So some of these I'm hard coding in minus XG. I'll just show you in a second what all this I'm talking about. Let's put it in inch pounds. All right. So what we're talking about here is this moment times this distance. So I did 3 plus... 1.5 minus that, so that gave me this total distance. And we could do it different ways, but that's, I wanted to do as much not hard coding into the MathCAD sheets as possible so that um, we could change things up, but I did hard code in the three and the 1.5. Um, we could change that if we wanted to, but I'm not too worried about it right now. All right, so the first thing we could do is we could just do our direct shear calculation. 
it's just going to be f over a. And this is the direct shear that um, is experiencing or being experienced by the weld group. Uh, we'll put it in KSI. So not a lot, one and a half KSI. So this is here, the 1,000 pounds over here. One of the things is it is trying to do this, but it's also trying to do this. So the one we just calculated, the 1.5 KSI, is this direct shear. Um, we're going to have to combine the direct shear with the secondary shear in a second. So if we were to draw, why don't we redraw just our weld group, maybe a little larger, so that we can uh, label some things on it. And I'll draw it as a, you know, a dimension thing, but your book treats it as a line. Um, your book does go through and talk a little bit about the fact that they treat the, the weld groups or the welds themselves as lines and not uh, having any size to them. And they make a little quick thought process about um, the fact that doing this, treating it like a line instead of a, an object with dimension is a actually a little bit more conservative than if you were to go in and actually deal with the area, the volume or anything of the weld itself. So I'm going to draw it this way just so we don't lose track of it because there's going to be a lot of lines on here. So what we've done, we found the, the centroid of the weld group and we put it at 0 0.45 and, uh, well, no, not 0 0.5, that's one inch, one inch there. <clears throat> and we just took our 1,000 pounds from here and we've moved it to the weld group, basically. But uh, that moving the 1,000 pounds from here to the centroid of the weld group doesn't have the full effect of what was happening when we had this eccentric load. Now we need to calculate this moment that was also created. Um, we did go and calculate the direct shear also. We'll get to the, back to that in a second. Um, but let's calculate this moment. Actually, we already did that moment. It was 4,000. I didn't write it down, though. 4,050 uh, inch-pounds. We did calculate that. Um, now, these are the same effect as this 1,000 pounds eccentrically loaded from the weld group. Um, so this force and moment create the same effect. Then what we did is we took the direct shear, the 1,000 pounds, and divided by the area of our weld group and got our direct shear stress. And what we're going to do with that is typically the weld group has um, every corner is a potential mode of failure or location for failure. And so we're going to take this corner and this corner, and this one, and this one. So now we're back to essentially what we did with the bolt pattern a few, maybe a week ago, maybe a little more than a week. So we're gonna go and let's use green. We're gonna find these moment arms here, here, here and here. So this will be point A, point B, let's do C and D. All right, so this will be R A, R B, R C, R D. Um, so this just labeling the different distances. Now R A and R D are the same distance and R B and R C are the same distance. So um, we'll, be able to deal with those as groups. All right, so the direct shear, um, if we have a thousand pounds that wants to directly shear our weld group, 
then it creates a shear stress. I'm going to put it this way. And the value was um, 1.51 KSI. I'm just going to label it as the direct shear at B. Um, and we'll put over here, direct shear is 1.51 KSI. And that is the same at any of these locations. This one's hard to, we'll put it over here. Okay. The secondary shear, um, so I'm drawing these as reactions, right? So the 1000's going down, these are the reactions to it to keep that from happening. So the uh, moment wants to shear this direction. You know, it wants to do this thing. So the welds are having to react against that and the secondary shear is going to be like this um, at each one of these locations. And this is going to be a right angle. Oh, I shouldn't have written that there, huh? That's a C, a right angle. That would be the secondary shear at D, a right angle. And uh, this way. secondary shear at A with a right angle. And we can see that um, at D and at A, the primary and secondary shears don't add together. The Y component, well, the, the direct shear is in the Y direction, upwards Y direction, whether that's positive or negative, uh, it doesn't really matter, but it goes up uh, on the, all of them. And the Y component for the secondary at A and at D goes down. So those are probably not our worst case scenarios, but we could check them to be sure. These actually are going to be the same. They have the same moment arm. RB and RC are the same distances. We need to figure that out in a second. Um, and the secondary component Y coordinate or Y uh, piece component again uh, adds to the primary in both of these cases. So B and C are going to be uh, probably our worst case scenarios. So why don't we um, work on calculating those moment arms? So we'll go back to MathCAD. All right, so RA is equal to, um, and what I'm doing here is, uh, so this would be A, uh, I'm just going to make this little triangle where it has a base of 0.45, a height of 1, and then we're just going to calculate the hypotenuse. So it's equal to the square root of uh, 0 0.45 inches squared. Whoops. Whoops. I need a square in there. Get in there. There we go. Plus um, a height of 1 inch squared, which I guess we could just put one, but let's write the whole thing out. And that equals in inches 1.907. Okay. And then um, that is the same for RA or RD. So we could also do RD just equals RA. We can do that. Okay. Um, and then the others R B. Let's use capital B since I used it. It's a capital letter already. Same deal except, oh, I didn't switch it over. We'll do it in a second. Um, the triangle that we'll create is right here. So it has a base of, we never calculated that. We kind of did when we uh, did the moment calculation up here, but it's 1.5 minus 0.5 to get this size. whatever that is, and then it has a height of one inch. And we'll calculate that hypotenuse, and it would be the same for RC. All right, so there you can see the calculations we did for RA and D. So RB is the square root of, um, let's see, I did the X first last time, so let's do them that way again. 1.5 inches minus 0.45, and we could use XG in here to make it a little more, uh, um, Parametric, we could have done that here also. 
although I'm hard coding in the 1.5, so. Oh, except I put zero. You don't want that. There we go. All right, so this piece squared and then plus one again just for completeness. So they do have slightly longer moment arms than RA. <clears throat> now my picture is more exaggerated than that. RC equals the same as R. All right, so we have our moment arms. To calculate our secondary shear, your book has an equation. Does it actually ever write it out? Let's see, here it is. So here are your two primary and secondary uh, shear equations for these joints and torsions. So the first one is just force over area. So the 1,000 pounds over the weld group area, throat area. This one is MR over J. So that moment is the moment that we calculated when we did 1,000 times the 3 plus the 1.05 number. R is going to be the moment arm. J is this uh, polar moment of inertia from here. So we need to work on J. So here's our weld group. Here's JU. I've got to type all of this in. That's just the unitized version though, so it's not, it doesn't include the actual dimensions of the weld. So we'll have to multiply this calculation times 0 0.707 times H. And if you forget that, the equation for that is equation 9-6, way down there at the very bottom. All right, back to MathCAD. So <clears throat> J equals 0 0.707 times H time, oops, H times J U. So we need to tell it what J U is. Oops. All right. J U comes from table 9 1, and I don't know that equation. We'll have to read it out of the book. <clears throat> All right. And this is where you make sure you're using the correct table 9 1 versus 9 2. Um, so 8 times b cubed uh, plus 6 times b times d plus d cubed over 12 all of that minus b to the fourth over 2 times b plus D. All right. Doesn't like, oh, D is supposed to be squared in this one. Okay. And we don't want it in liters. These are going to be, uh, normally, you know, moments of inertia are inches to the fourth, but uh, we still have to multiply times that 0.707H, so this is actually inches cubed. 4.9, and then that gives J equal to, and again, let's do it in inches cubed, inches to the fourth, 0.65, <clears throat> if we did everything correctly. Let's, let's just check through it to make sure. 8B cubed, BD squared plus D cubed over 12, minus B, 2 times B plus D, I think that's correct, and then 0.77H, H is defined to be 316th still. So that should give us a value for J. Now, M, um, there's going to be two different values for the, uh, not M, we already have M for tau, the secondary version. Um, there's actually, we're going to have to put a subscript on here because there's tau at each one of these corners, A, B, C, and D. A and D are the same, and B and C are the same. So let's do B first. So this would also be, uh, valid for tau C. We'll plug that in in a second. Uh, so M times RB over J. And that's equation um, 9, 5. MR over J. And let's put it in KSI. <coughs> 9 KSI. 
and just for completeness, tau um, c double. Well, let's put double. Oh my goodness! I don't want to erase that. That's not how this one ended up. I like them to be the same, even though it doesn't actually matter. All right, tau c equals uh, tau double prime b. Okay, and um, we do have the secondary shear at a and d also. M times R A over J, and it's less. The, the the M and J are the same numbers, but the moment arm is smaller. Remember, so R A is a shorter distance than R B, and then same thing here. Tau double prime D is equal to tau double prime uh, a. All right, there, we don't need that, but I just want it to be complete, I guess. In fact, I haven't saved this in a while. Let's save this so that we have, uh, let's just put it on the desktop somewhere. Uh, let's call that weld in torsion. Well, there we go. Now we need to combine these together. So uh, we can't just add them together. Uh, we have to break, in this case, the secondary component into X and Y components and add the X's together, add the Y's together, and then take the resultant of those two components. Um, and so that means we're gonna need this angle, or we need some angle. This one is the one I'm gonna use. Uh, so that's the same as this angle. And if that's not um, obvious on how to do that, then um, one thing you can think of is here, anytime you have a, I've got a right angle right here between the stress in this case, a lot of times it'll be a force, but here is a stress and this moment arm. And I could take the moment arms uh, angle from horizontal that'll be the same as the force or the stresses angle from vertical. So that's that's what we're doing here. And there's some geometric rules. This probably has a name. Uh, it's the same as this alternate interior angle here. And those are complementary or whatever all the terms are supposed to be. You could also work through it that way. Um, but this angle and this angle are the same. Uh, this angle is the inverse tangent. So let's put uh, alpha. Alpha is inverse tangent of 1 over this dimension, 1.5 minus 0 0.45. And that's going to be, I don't know, 20. Let's calculate it. A tan. Actually, let's do um, alpha equals A tan of 1 over... 1.5 minus uh, x g. Oh, 1.5. These have to be inches. There we go. Um, that's radians. Let's make it in degrees, though. 43 degrees. Okay. That seems... Yeah, I guess the way I drew it, if I drew it anywhere near to scale, that looks kind of like a uh, 43 degree angle, I suppose. <clears throat> I, can, I can believe that. Um, and I did roughly draw it to scale. It should be a little taller. If this is one and a half, I made that about the same, um, which would just make this a steeper, which, okay. We'll say we can go with that. All right, so now what I can do is I can take the uh, X and Y components of the secondary shear stress 
and add this together. So what I'm going to do is tau at B, let's put it, I don't want to write in red, maybe right here, tau the shear stress at B, not the secondary or the primary, but the resultant shear stress at B is going to equal the square root of, let's do our X components. Now tau, uh, the primary shear doesn't have an X component. I'm assuming X is horizontal, Y is vertical. Um, so there's only an X component of the uh, secondary shear, which is going to be tau B secondary times uh, the sine of this angle sine of alpha um, squared and then plus the y components I've got the total amount of the direct shear plus the cosine alpha times the secondary shear squared so that equation um, will give me the resultant shear stress at B and a similar one will give me the resultant um, at A. Now this this same number will be exactly the same shear stress at C but it will be different for A and D. In fact let's write down A just so we have it. So the square root of our X components we have oh we got we need different angles here don't we? Why don't we um, why don't we uh, do beta for this one so if this angle is beta, then so would this one be beta. So the thing about these equations, I don't even think your book um, like puts out a, an equation that shows you the uh, way to combine these. But over in maybe one of these examples, yeah, so they have it written out in here but these are specific to this problem uh, so you do have to look at every problem in fact this problem um, I think I'll maybe I've already put it in the description for this video but I do work out this entire problem example 9-1 um, with some CAD models because um, the example itself is not terribly tricky um, and there's nothing wrong in here but visualizing what all is going on uh, particularly getting from here to here, a lot of people get confused on that. So I, I went through and worked this one out, uh, and there's a whole video on just working out this example, um, and, and it includes some CAD models so that you can see what, what all these things are. Um, but don't just blindly follow a pattern about calculating this shear stress. All right, so back to A. Um, so we would need the X component of A, or X component of our primary shear doesn't have one in this case, but you could totally have a uh, shear stress that's going horizontal and then it does have an X but no Y. Um, the direct shear at an angle is possible too if this uh, was, you know, at some kind of angle. You could have a X and Y component to your direct shear. Um, we just don't have that in this case. All right, so um, tau double prime A times the way I wrote it here, cosine beta squared plus these we have to subtract because uh, the Y component for the primary shear at A goes up minus the uh, secondary shear component in the Y direction, which will be sine of beta. So these equations, I do remember a lot of times students getting confused on how to generate these. All you're doing is taking the X and Y components of the two forces at uh, the location that you're interested in. This would be the same value for D um, because it doesn't matter that the shear is going to the left or right. Um, in this case, it just gets squared by itself. So it doesn't matter if it adds or subtracts to anything because the direct shears have no X component. All right, so let's put this equation in MathCAD. I, maybe we can put this one in too. Um, I didn't calculate this angle though, um, so we probably we'll, we'll just do the B. We'll do the B only because um, we calculated the secondary shear at A and B, and the secondary shear at B, so this value, is larger than this value, plus the 
uh, Y components add between primary and secondary at B and at C, and they subtract at A and D. So we're pretty sure that our serious or critical location is not A and D, it's B or C. So we're only going to do the B. All right, so tau, not G, at B, which is also equal to tau at C, is equal to the square root. Oh, wow, let's see if we can get all these things written in. So this will be sine, I did use alpha, so secondary at B times the sine of alpha that whole term squared plus the primary so primary at b which is added to the y component of the secondary but only the y component which should be cosine of alpha all of that term squared, and then we take the square root. Oh, something did this not not how I wrote that. Oh, I never calculated that. Oh, I just did this um, because they're all the same. So let's go and specifically write one for B. They're all the same though. Oops, need that. All right, and A and B and C and D would all be the same. All right, let's put this in KSI. 10 KSI. <clears throat> so is that bad? Well, now um, for the weld group. Now, the we didn't even talk about the base metal material for this or this piece, um, so we don't know anything about it. But, you know, we would have to go look up its properties and compare those based on... Uh, what table 9.4 tells us, which is going to be 40% of the um, yield strength of the base material. There's table 9.7, so we skipped it. So right here, shear stress on the base metal should not exceed 0.4 of the yield strength of the base metal. So we'd have to go find that number and see. I don't think we're 40% of the base metal properties, I think we're okay for most of them. Uh, well, I don't know. Some of them are pretty low um, for when you get into the hot rolled properties in shear. Or, well, this is the yield, I mean. Um, so it is possible. We're kind of close. You know, you go to table A20. Let's find that real quick. And our yield strength for, you know, these mildish in the middle, 1020. Yield strength is 30 KSI, so um, that would be 12 KSI would be the allowable. And we're at 10, so we're close. We have a little bit of factor of safety on the base metal, but not a lot. Um, for the weld material, we go to, um, you know, we didn't specify which weld, but let's go to the weakest weld uh, electrode, uh, so a 60. So if we did 60 times 0.3, that would give us 18 KSI. We're at 10 KSI, so we're, we're okay on the uh, weld itself, which is generally true. Generally, the weld material, the electrode material, is stronger than the base material. Um, and then you're counting on, uh, if anything fails, it's not because the weld failed. It's because, you know, the entire machine was designed badly or something. Um, so, but not the weld. So, you do make the weld stronger than the other parts of it. All right, so that is the torsion side of things. Now, you may think that uh, we'll never have time to do the bending one, but it's very uh, same approach. You use a table, if I can find it, did I skip it? We use table 9-2, which I can't get all of it on here without knocking stuff down. There's, there's most of it. Um, it actually goes over two pages also. And this is for the bending, bending properties of fillet welds. All right, so why don't we jump over, let's see, we have, I think we have enough time. Um, let's go over to, not here, 
we may keep that for the time being, but let's go to here. This is Fusion 360. I'm just going to use it um, for the time being uh, just to have a different thing out there. So let's just draw up what we're talking about for the bending because a lot of times people get, um, I don't know, hard to visualize why bending versus torsion or, you know, how do you pick one versus the other? So here, this is going to be our wall that we mount to, right? So this is the thing we're going to weld to. Um, and let's weld a cantilever off of it. I'm not doing any kind of dimensions here. These are just uh, whatever it happens to be when we quit drawing. So there's our cantilever that we're going to weld onto here. And we're going to weld it in two places, let's say. We're going to weld here and this one with a fillet weld. And let's just uh, something like that. Um, maybe so those can be more visible. Let's let's uh, color them some color. Um, let's go with just paint. Uh, glossy paint. Why not? They can be blue. There we go. It didn't grab it for a while. Oh, but I don't want, uh, I want just the face. All right. So these two, you know, we could weld down the side here also, but, um, let's just do top and bottom. And then we're going to have a point load. Let's make a point load. Kind of do it this way. Uh, we'll do that. And then we'll do this. That's about right. Let's make it a little taller. Wow, it, depending on how far I'm zoomed out, it, it snaps to different things. Okay, we'll do that. And um, to make it look like an arrow, let's do this. All right. There we go. And we can do this. All of this is completely unnecessary. Just for the fun. There we go. So there's our point load on the end of this thing. We could even color that if we wanted to, but I don't think that's necessarily the point. Um, so this is bending. Uh, we have a shear stress created here because of this eccentric load. Um, but instead of trying to twist it off of the thing that's welded to, so let's, let's, uh, this, this is the stationary part. Uh, and it's trying to pull it off of there. It's still going to fail in shear in this weld, this blue weld. This bottom weld down here is actually being compressed, right? So it does have to handle the direct shear of this. Um, but the way the bending, you know, it's trying to bend downwards. So this bottom one is in compression. Um, so it's not necessarily the one that we're most concerned about, although we are going to treat these as a weld group. Um, but it's at the top up here where... Uh, this one's being trying to be ripped off of the wall, right? That we're going to worry about. <clears throat> All right. So um, I don't have any dimensions for any of this that mean anything, but um, we'll just use some similar dimensions to the one we used last time. Um, and let's calculate this guy in uh, bending versus torsion. Uh, your book does have an example, one example of a bending problem. Uh, they call it example 9-4. And we can look at that real quick just so you have an idea. This one um, is similar except what they've done is they put their welds on the side, right? So they have 3 8 inch welds um, on the arrow side and the other side. So they would have, if, if you're looking at this diagram, what they have compared to what we have is they put the welds down this line. Oh, I can't highlight whether it is uh, down that line and the one on the other side over there. 
So they put the welds down that and they don't have welds on the top and bottom. So that problem is going to look very much like this one, except when they go to use the table, they'll use uh, a little, they'll use the actually, um, does it specify two different setups? Let me see. Yeah, it actually does have two different. They do have, uh, they would be using case two here where there's two parallel uh, vertical ones. And then we will be using case three, which is two parallel horizontal welds. And then you have all the other patterns that you might come up with. All right, so let's uh, put in some numbers here so that we can have something to work from. We'll just draw something real quick. We have time. Um, so from the side. There's our stationary piece. There's our cantilever. Here's our thousand pound point load. Uh, we're gonna put our welds. Um, it's gonna be kind of hard. We'll put them right in this corner. This one would be better to show from like a front view where you can actually see the weld. You don't normally want to dimension things where they're into the page if you don't have to. Um, but we're only going to draw this one picture, so we'll do it this way. Let's just keep using our 316s that we've been using. And their fillet welds on this side and the other side. All right. Um, so we'll have to build a thickness. So let's say this guy is six inches, and then. Um, Thickness equals, let's just make it, um, I don't know, a half inch. There's a question. Let's see. Would you set up the same type of points of shear stress if your weld geometry was that of case two? Let's see. So this is talking about the torsion one, I assume. Um, case two in table nine, one. Oh, yeah, so that one, um, well, so the difference would be uh, they're all equal. So case two, oh, you can't see that zoomed in too close. So case two, every point is equal. Um, they're equal radius or moment arm from the center centroid. Uh, so you wouldn't really need to do four indivi individual points because they're all the same. Uh, so whereas this one points... Uh, what we call B and C have different moment arms from A and D. So that's why we had to do separate ones. Um, and so you would do that idea, except that you wouldn't, you'd only need to do one of them because they all have the same moment arm and they all have the same direct shear. So you would not need to do anything other than pick one of them. And uh, they will have um, some of them where they add the secondary and primary components add together and some where they subtract. And so you just pick the ones that add together and all the other terms would be the same. You use the same process though. So I guess the answer is yes, um, but not quite. Um, so back to this guy, we've got uh, equations. Let's look at our equations. There's these two. Well, these two really. Uh, so there you have the same setup for the direct shear. The direct shear is just the shear force. In this case, we used a thousand pounds over the area. We haven't calculated the area of the weld yet. Um, they have I instead of J. So it's moment of inertia instead of polar moment of inertia for the torsion ones. And um, they do the same thing where you take the unit version from the table 9-2. So there's a whole set of unit unitized uh calculations for the different weld groups and you multiply times the size of the throat and then here's the secondary mc over i so that's just a bending stress right uh, so we calculate the moment again 
Uh, C is going to be the distance from the center, centroid of the weld group to the point we're interested in. And then I is this number that we calculate from table 9 to. All right. And then to add them together, they actually do add more simply um, because the way that the shear, so let's look at this weld that would be right here. So this is, this is the little weld that's, you know, right down here somewhere. Uh, what we're doing, and again, they treat this as a line, not as a triangle. Um, the direct shear just fell on the floor. Use this one, I guess. The direct shear is, well, it's going up or down, uh, depending on which way you're thinking of. Are we talking about the stress in the weld or the reaction of the weld? So. Uh, I guess this way I'm thinking of the stress in the weld. So there's the direct shear and the bending shear, the shear that comes from bending um, is going to come out this way. Your book describes it as horizontal shear stress component from uh, the bending, the moment induces. So this stress, the secondary one is induced by the moment. And the nice thing about this is that these are already orthogonal. So you just do tau equals the square root of tau prime squared plus tau double prime squared. So they're a lot simpler to deal with. You don't have to figure out um, the individual components. All right, so let's go back to here and to MathCAD here, let's make a, Let's so just make a new sheet. All right. MathCAD is totally fine um, to do more than one thing at once, you know, on, on a sheet, one after the other. You just have to be careful that you don't uh, forget to redefine some variables. I a lot of times use MathCAD to remind me to, oh, I need to find this piece of information. But like H, in this case, it wouldn't matter because both the problem we did in torsion and this bending one have the same leg size for the welds. But um, MathCAD would say that, oh, you've already defined H, you don't need it again. So it wouldn't remind me to put in a value for H. Um, and if I had a different leg size, then I would get all the wrong numbers. Um, so let's, so I'll just create a new sheet. So this primary shear is equal to F over A. All right, and it's gonna tell me that it doesn't know either one of those things. Actually it does, but it's uh, like, farads and amps, so that's not what we want. Uh, F is a thousand pounds. <clears throat> and A, same thing as before. We have a table 9-2 that actually gives you the value for A, or equation for A. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Now this one looks a little different because it's 0.141, but it's just 2 times 0.707 times H times B, so not that much different. Um, H, which we don't have, times uh, they use B, which we also don't have. So H is, we're going to use the 3 sixteenths of an inch. Wow, I just erased the 3 sixteenths. There we go. And B, I, I was talking while I wrote it down, but I wrote it down as half an inch. And then we might as well evaluate this to make sure we're reasonable. That seems reasonable. And now we have a value for our direct shear. And it's actually kind of high. 7,500 KSI. We have much less weld area than we did on that previous one. Uh, these are only half inch long and they're still the 3 sixteenths of an inch um, leg size. So that doesn't create a lot of weld for the same 1,000 pounds. And we have a larger moment arm, which doesn't affect the direct shear, but it's going to affect our secondary shear. All right, so M is F times, looking at our picture, 6. We'll just hard code in the 6 inches. Uh, and we'll change that over to inch pounds. And then our secondary shear is equal to uh, M 
C over I. Um, we don't have C or I yet. C is easy enough. Let's. Uh, so C is, you know, the centroid for this weld group is going to be on this line. I actually didn't give a dimension that way, so it's not very simple to do. Let's make that two inches. So C is going to be from the neutral axis up to the top of the weld, or to the weld. We're going to do the top of our beam here, um, which is actually the bottom of the weld. So that's one of the things about um, treating these welds as lines versus actually having geometry. Um, technically, we should go from the neutral axis up to the centroid of the weld itself, but we're treating the weld like a line um, where it does have some actual dimension to it. But by what we're doing, it, it uh, makes it a more conservative approach. So um, we're just going to do one inch for C. I is one of those where I equals 0.707 times H times I unit. So we need to figure out the unit version of I. Oh, th I, this does remind me of something. Um, so in your book, I think it is the example that goes with this, this example. Let me see. Mm. Yeah, right in here. So they do some stuff. They're calculating uh, stress. Um, this is actually for the bar itself not the weld but the bar and they do some you know it's kind of hidden what they are doing here i over c is bd squared over six where c is clearly not six and so what they all they did here is they skipped a bunch of steps if you write out this equation and all the steps you will get to here i is just a rectangle bh cubed or um, in their case bd cubed or Actually, they might have B as the base and D as the height. So BD cubed over 12 and C is 1 or it's it's half of D. And so you can get there. So they, this is one of the things I don't actually care for in the way they do some examples is there will be a step like this where it's really hard to just see what they did. Um, but don't assume that this is transferable to everything that you do. Um, in this case, it will work. It would work for us also because we have a solid bar, uh, but it won't work for every shape. So make sure that you understand what's going on in all the little steps in, in the examples that are worked out. Back to our problem. Um, IU, we need to find our case three, and it says that IU is equal to B, this is from table 9-2. B times D squared over 2. We have not put a value for D in yet. D is 2 inches, and I just wrote that just a few minutes ago. This is D. Um, and we could actually write C is 1 half of D would be a little more correct than what we did there. All right, so let's check out what this says. Okay, uh, relatively small. Let's see how many KSI, 45 KSI, that's gonna be way too much, right? Um, so we definitely need larger welds or less force on this setup. Um, we haven't even calculated the actual resultant shear stress either. So to do that, the shear stress is equal to the square root of the primary shear. Oh, wait, I need to change that to this. Primary shear squared plus the secondary shear squared. And this is because the secondary shear, again, it's only a horizontal component induced from the moment created by this eccentric load about that point. So 
So, well, yeah, the primary shear was... Hmm. Well, I would have thought it would have had a little bit more effect than that. But I guess it doesn't. It has a tiny effect. All right. Um, so 45 KSI, that would be ridiculously large for most of these uh, weld materials. We could... So what we could do is... Where's our table? Nine three table nine three, next page. So we could try and find a stronger electrode material, right? Um, we need one that uh, fillet weld in shear. Uh, Thirty percent of this number is greater than forty five ksi. So if we, even if we did the one twenty, what does that give us? One twenty times point three is thirty six ksi. So even the e one twenty is not a strong enough weld material electrode material um, to handle the shear stress that this setup would have in it so we would need to increase the weld size so you know we could go in mathcad at least and just go back to h and let's just make it uh, 4 16 so it's a half inch now we're at 34 so we could technically get away with the e120 electrode and have a tiny factor of safety on the weld we haven't checked the stress uh, for the bar itself, well, you know, it could be that the bar can't support uh, the thousand pounds on its own, whether or not the weld is there. Um, then we go to five sixteenths. Now we're getting a little more reasonable. Um, you know, 27 KSI is still really high for a shear stress in a weld, though. Uh, and you could just get a rate to figure out. You could even plot. You could, you could make H a variable and plot and see where uh, you want it to end up at. Um, all right, we are out of time. Next time we will do another weld, actually the last weld topic, um, and it'll be welds in fatigue. So these loads won't be static anymore. Uh, and so how are we going to deal with a fluctuating load? All right, I will see you guys. Uh, that'll be on Friday. So I'll see you all Friday.